So I see that we've got Commissioner O'Brien. So I think we'll, we'll take a, a, a roll call first, a reminder to everyone that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, Commissioner Cameron? Uh, good morning, everyone. I am here. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien? Uh, I am here. Good morning. Commissioner Zuniga? Good morning, everyone here. And uh, Vivian, thank you. We're all set to get started. Today is Thursday, March 11th. It's just um, 10.03. It's public meeting number 338. And before we get started, I just have a few words to share. Yesterday marked the one year anniversary of Governor Baker's executive order in which he declared a state of emergency as the number of coronavirus cases approached 100 in the Commonwealth. It was on the one year anniversary of this public meeting, then March 12th, that we were forced to suspend our ordinary business of the day and adjourn our meeting prematurely as news revealed that the reach of the virus was presenting potential risk to the patrons and employees of the gaming establishments. When the news hit, the Gaming Commission was prepared. For over a month, we had been coordinating with our licensee who could share experience in Macau. The licensees were retaining their own public health specialists to help guide their businesses, and they were generously sharing what they were learning in real time. We were meeting with our other regulators across the United States to become better informed. We connected with other large venues within Massachusetts to learn how they were preparing. The MGC team members internally were following closely public health trends with the same time, while at the same time preparing for uh, re remote work arrangements. The Secretary of the Executive Office of Health and Human Services the Commissioner of Public Health and the extraordinary team at the Department of Public Health made themselves personally and immediately available to the MGC to share guidance that we all know now was changing by the hour and at times by the minute. With that preparation, two days later on Saturday morning, March 14th, my fellow commissioners and I made the historic decision with the support of our licensees who were all present for this full and first remote public meeting to suspend operations of all three gaming establishments in an orderly and timely fashion. The decision had, of course, enormous implications as so many jobs were at stake. But the decision was based on extensive thoughtful analysis with input from key stakeholders and experts to whom we again extend our gratitude. To the leadership at Encore Boston Harbor, MGM Springfield, and Plain Ridge Park Casino, your teams and your corporate parents, a special thank you for all that you did then and for your ongoing cooperation and vigilance. None of us at that time could have predicted the magnitude of the loss that would be suffered in the year ahead. Our nation has lost 529,000 individuals to COVID-19. Over 16,000 of those deaths have occurred right here in Massachusetts. That equates to the population of twice that of the small town in which I grew up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. And the impact on businesses, jobs, our healthcare providers, first responders, frontline workers, school children and their parents and guardians, young adults off to college, and our nation's overall mental health can't even begin to be fully measured. But today we are sensing hope. We are hopeful. And so I ask uh, each of you at the MGC, many of whom are listening right now, are participating today, and all who have demonstrated such consistent teamwork, commitment, courage, and personal resilience over the last year, to take the time today on this warm winter day to intentionally pause to mourn those that were lost, to give thanks where you are able, and reflect on all that we can be in the months ahead. And with that, we'll turn to the business of the day. Commissioner O'Brien for the minutes, please. Thank you, Kathy. I can't believe it's pity, um, but thank you for summarizing that for us today. Um, moving on to, uh, ministerial matters in terms of the minutes. The first minutes from November 5th 
um, of 2020, we pulled off the last agenda, the last meeting so that we could go back and put some more detail in that sort of thing. I did review it with um, General Counsel Grossman. I have one suggested typo to fix that I didn't catch the first time I went through, um, which is on page 10. It just says PM instead of AM on the timestamp. Um, so that we can just clean that up. And then the other minutes, there are timestamps at certain points. Um, each time we change topics, I just think that we should insert the actual timestamp. So it's just a matter of ministerially going in and adding a few more of the timestamps in the left margin. Um, when within the topic, we then switch to a subtopic. So if it went from Karen to Loretta, et cetera. So if there is a long bullet point in the agenda, at least somebody has a little more guidance going in. Um, other than that, I was um, pleased with the work that they did in editing it. But before I moved to have them approved, I just wanted to throw it out to the three of you to see if your thoughts on that. Commissioner Cameron? Yeah, I, I think those are really appropriate and thoughtful uh, changes. So I, I certainly would, uh, would agree with, with those changes for this particular set of mi minutes and moving forward. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Zinnika, are you all set? Uh, yeah, um, I would just uh, continue to, um, to make a point that's been made before in terms of um, you know, workload to produce the minutes, trying to find that balance behind, you know, uh, nailing down the, the time uh, stamp, for example, which I think is appropriate. I'm, I'm going through the minutes from, um, excuse me, the ones that you referenced, the second and the third uh, ones, and that, that mm -hmm. it really seems like that, that time stamp is, is really missing from the yeah. big topics. Uh, I would just suggest it, it might not be necessary to, to time stamp every single um, um, sub conversation, but but I but I think it's a good point and I think it's necessary. I didn't I know. Sure. Yeah, I, I agree, and I'm going to come. I'm really going to defer to Commissioner O'Brien and the legal team for how they um, um, continue. I feel like we're getting the degree of detail that um, works, and in, in, uh, including our our points, the commissioner's points. So I was really pleased with that. So thank you. Um, so having said that, Madam Chair, um, I would move that the commission approve the minutes from November 5th of 2020, um, subject to the edits that we've discussed today, and also subject to correction for typographical or any other. Any other. Any other? Okay, thank you. Sorry, I All second right. that motion. Great, thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. And Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And that's yes for me. Four zero, Vivian, please. Uh, Madam Chair, moving on to November 19th, 2020. Um, other than suggesting that the topic timestamps are inserted as appropriate, I would move that the commission approve the minutes from November 19th, 2020, subject to correction for typographical error, error or other non-material matters. Second. Second. Okay. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zunica. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero, Vivian, thank you. And lastly, these are relatively short minutes on the 25th. I didn't really see the need to insert timestamps on this. So I would move that the commission approve the minutes for November 25th, 2020, subject to any corrections for typographical errors or other non-material matters. Second. Okay, no further questions. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero. Thank you. Moving on to, and thank you for all the good work uh, to the legal team. I think it's a joint effort between Vivian and Tanya and, um, and the, the legal team, so thank you. And moving on now to the administrative update, Executive Director Wells, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we're going to start off with the on-site casino update. So I'm going to turn that over to a Director Lilios and Assistant Director Van to give you an update on what's going on at the casinos on-site related to COVID. Thanks, Karen. Good, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. And uh, Kathy, thank you for those sobering but hopeful uh, comments on this year mark. Uh, so since the last time we updated you on the um, COVID uh, 
uh, matters at your February 25th open meeting. Capacity limits have remained the same at each of the three properties at the 40% level. And all three properties have been operating well under that 40% limit. They continue to be open on a 24 seven basis. All of the COVID health and safety measures have remained in place. The hotel at Encore has been open weekends, uh, Thursday through Sunday. It's been uh, doing well. They are managing their checkout times in a way to spread out the exit of people from the hotel uh, uh, when they leave at the end of the weekend to uh, reduce any uh, crowding, congregating at the elevators, and those efforts have been successful. They transitioned their oyster bar to, you, you may remember the oyster bar as a small eatery mm -hmm. uh, into a, a different eatery. I think it's called Cheese, Meat and Wine. It's a small space. They've been working with reservations, but the uh, rollout of that has been successful. With respect to the hotel at MGM, that does uh, remain open on the weekends for hosted uh, guests and uh, that has been operating without uh, incident. The MGM Taps Sports Bar is open on the weekends now, and the reports are that patrons are enjoying it. And like the report from, the, uh, from two weeks ago, there are no significant incidents of uh, concern uh, to note. I know Assistant Director Band is on the call. He uh, may have some um, more details on some of the operational uh, aspects. So I'd invite him to uh, give you any updates and then we'd be happy to try to answer any questions you, you might have. Bruce? Bruce, you're on mute. Uh, there we go. <laughs> that would make it a quiet update, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> as far as capacities go, uh, MGM's high number was uh, on February 27th, they uh, had 1,825 uh, uh, people, which brought them to 23.3%. And uh, they had a special event at that time, which was a BMW giveaway. And that was uh, brought in probably about 400 extra people uh, for that date. Uh, and of course, the next weekend, they opened up the hotel and taps. Uh, PPC had a high number of uh, 1,363 or 23.5% and that was on March 6th. Encore had a high number of 3,376 on March 6th as well and that was 19.86%. Uh, all the restaurants have maintained proper spacing uh, uh, since the increase by the governor's or orders as far as capacity goes. Uh, we also are all ready for uh, the daylight savings event, which in this industry is always interesting. This time of year, it's not too bad, but in the fall, it affects all the clocks in the casino because you don't want to send out markers and, and fills with the same time stamp on it when you, know, you turn the clocks back. So uh, we don't change the clocks in the casino uh, in the fall till uh, after the end of the gaming day. So we're all set for that. Uh, any questions or anything? Any questions? No, thank you, Bruce. You're thank welcome. you very much. Uh, and so, Madam Chair, the other thing I just wanted to reference with respect to, uh, you know, the casinos being open, uh, just to refer back to a conversation that we had um, at the last commission meeting where we did talk about um, employees coming back to work and what the casino Opio were doing when we did the um, quarterly report. Uh, the uh, efforts by casinos to encourage um, their employees to come back and to allow them to come back. And, you know, we've noted that uh, this uh, pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women in the workforce. So I just wanted to uh, alert the commission. We are, in fact, on a staff level working with the casinos to get more information on the efforts that they are making to make sure that uh, these employees are given every opportunity to come back, particularly uh, women who may be impacted. I know this was a great concern to Commissioner O'Brien and we've been, we've been chatting about that. Uh, so we expect uh, at 
potentially at the next commission meeting, I would have further discussion on this. You know, we're, we're dealing with another issue later in the agenda about opening up uh, some uh, games which may impact uh, having more opportunities for people to come back to work. So this, this is a really important issue. I just wanted to flag that, that we're looking at that. And, and uh, if there's any further direction by the commissioners, as we work uh, with the licensees on this, we would welcome some input on, on uh, that direction. If I could, Madam yes, I thank you, Karen, for that update. I know you and I have been talking about this and following up. Um, I do think it's really important to follow up with them now. Um, there is discussion of requests to open up and change configurations. Elementary schools will be open by the first week in April at the latest, middle schools at the end of the month. So I could anticipate there would be more um, amenities opening, you know, other job opportunities for recall might be coming up, particularly with the elementary middle schools going back, that may open up opportunities for caregivers, primarily women, who maybe had to say no earlier on in this process. So it is, it is absolutely the right time for us to go back and circle back with MGM, find out what EBH's policy is in terms of seniority and that sort of thing in their recall process, because I would hate to see someone left out Right. right now when these opportunities are coming back and schools are going back in and maybe some after school programs are available to people. So I, I really look forward to having that conversation. Yeah. Com Commissioner Cameron. Yeah. Executive Director Wells, um, part of the conversation we had around this issue was having to reapply for a job that you've had, but you just weren't able to go back um, initially because of uh, all of the uh, child care issues. Has that been discussed at all with the licensees? Uh, you know, I'll have, I think that, um, I think, I don't know if Jill Griffin is on the call because she had been coordinating uh, with Mary Kate Murren over at MGM. So I think they've, they've discussed that because I think the, um, the focus, as you've said, is how can we make this easier and how can we get people on the list so we can, they can get back? So uh, my understanding is, I think that discussion has taken place, but I would need to confirm that with Director Griffin. Okay. Yeah, and I would add in to um, a reminder that we were able to confirm that our licensing processes won't create any additional barriers with that application. I also, um, you know, I think um, the, the, and I know Commissioner Zunica joins us, but I think the three of us, um, perhaps as women, um, expressed our, our concerns about this particular issue, but I think we also understood that this could have an uh, this policy could have an inadvertent effect disproportionately on minority community as well. So we should um, keep that in mind. Uh, but we um, the the news have focus has truly focused on the impact on on women um, as caretakers, the primary caregivers at home. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, thank you for um, leading that conversation and keeping um, uh, keeping everyone at task. I think that um, Executive Director Wells, we can anticipate an update at our next meeting. So that would be two weeks from now. Correct. Correct. So uh, the team is working on it and then we'll get a report back. Is that gonna be good for you, Commissioner O'Brien? Yes, that's my understanding from conversations with Karen. I would have loved to have been today, but I also realized logistically that just wasn't gonna work out. So right. Right. Yeah. We'll do it on the yeah. Yeah, let's hope it's good reports. Um, excellent, thank you for staying on that, Karen. Yeah. Uh, any other questions on the reopening or the uh, update from uh, Director Lilios and Assistant Director Van? Okay. Uh, no, so then, thank you for continued vigilance. Right. Thanks. They've done a great job. And, and a big thank you to the state police and um, the gaming agents who continue to work on site. You know, uh, a lot of us in state government have been able to work remotely and, and they've been on site. So I did wanna uh, reiterate the thanks to those teams. And we had, you know, racing had been uh, working on site. Now they're off site because the racing season uh, has been completed. Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda, Madam Chair, uh, uh, the Communications division had been reviewing our website for just updates or things that needed to be refreshed. And we noted uh, that um, under the commission's mission and the commission's responsibilities, when you read it, uh, there may be some language in there that uh, is a little outdated because we have moved from being an agency that was uh, putting out the RFA one, the RFA two for these big licenses uh, for the 
casinos, and now we're in more of a regulatory state. So I did include in the packet the, what's on the website for the commission's mission and the commission's responsibilities. Uh, the commission's mission uh, is somewhat broad that may not need any updating, but in the commission's responsibilities, particularly in the second uh, sentence in there, you know, they talk about uh, hiring staff, retaining appropriate legal and gaming advisors, some of that's outdated. So I just thought it would be a good opportunity, um, you know, I'm going to work with Austin on updating the language, but to get some feedback from the commissioners on what you think uh, if we should, what you think we should be uh, focusing on, particularly on the commission's responsibilities, and to let me know if you want any uh, updates to the commission's mission. I do have the document here, if it's easier for the commissioners for me to share the screen, or if you have it already in front of you, please feel free to just let me know what works for you. Uh, commissioners, um, I'm not sure how we want to approach this. I don't think we'll probably wordsmith today um, because of just that we have a, a good, rigorous, uh, robust, I mean, um, agenda. Um, but maybe we should give some starting point, some high level thoughts, um, and, and maybe today concentrate on the responsibilities versus the mission statement. Um, if, has everybody had the chance to at least think about, okay, I see Commissioner Cameron, I'm going to call on you first, unless you want to, um, no, I'm happy to, to speak, and I, I credit the team for realizing this was an outdated, uh, in particular, the responsibilities were outdated, and we have, in fact, moved um, to a different stage of regulating. So I think, at a minimum, uh, updating the language, you know, maintain um, rather than um, build uh, an administrative, uh, you know, infrastructure to include the appropriate staff, you know, certainly adhere to the, um, um, rather than, I mean, I'm just updating the language. The other thing I think, so all of those words could be present tense, um, uh, but I also think one of the things we do spend time on, and this is a very good example of it now, we do have a responsibility to, uh, you know, really um, be exploring best practices, and, you know, so I think some, you know, sports betting is a perfect example of that, how much time and effort is spent exploring those best practices in the event that it is legal and in the event that we will regulate. So, I mean, um, I do think that's a piece that may, may be important to be incorporated into um, the present tense responsibilities. Okay. Commissioner Sunika, or, or Commissioner O'Brien might have been reaching first. Commissioner O'Brien? Right. <laughs> it's like pressing the button on the... I know. I, <laughs> I, um, I agree with everything Commissioner Cameron said. The other thought that I had, um, and I did some wordsmithing, Karen, I can, I'll just send you, oh, uh, uh, you know, for, you can digest it later, but yeah. what missing from responsibilities, um, in, aside from tense, was... Um, responsible gaming. I felt like there should be more of a conversation in there about um, our responsibility and efforts in terms of making sure that that's an integral part of this for the Commonwealth. Okay. So sure. however I think that's best handled. All right, we can add some language there. You stole my thought, uh, Commissioner O'Brien. <laughs> <I was. laughs> that's, that's what happens that's... when they lean in first, yeah. which well, is totally fine. She, yeah. she, she won in the race, okay. Yeah, Zinnica, I was, do you have another thought? Well, it was um, around, the, around the notion of focusing on player health and sustainability of, of the, not just the players, but also, you know, the broader um, gaming industry. Um, uh, so I can, I can also forward some, some, some um, key areas where that might fit, but uh, okay. that's, that's, a, that's a larger thought. I would do away with, um, and I think this is what's already spoken about, with uh, the selection of proposals right. language that, that really rings to the initial mindset that we had about the licensing process, even though there's technically, potentially, uh, mm -hmm. one more license to give on, on the ones that we have and others um, perhaps subject to um, legislation. Um, but anyway. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. Good effort. Yeah, I agree with all that's been said too. Commissioner Zuniga, we do want to be careful um, about doing it away, away the all together. Um, 
but I, I agree that how it's written right now would suggest the early stage versus where we are in present. Um, I, to just um, add on to Commissioner Cameron's notion of best practices, of course, those are best practices in the, in the gaming world. We also have an obligation to make sure that how we um, execute our job um, on in all the verticals from everything from our IP practices to our responsible gaming research practices and our, our business practices um, internally need to be, um, you know, really um, a, a, such a quality to always ensure the um, gaming integrity. So kind of that internal environment, Karen, is what I'm yeah. thinking of. Um, yeah. Internal operations, internal governance, internal controls. Um, that That isn't necessarily as kind of riveting in, in, in interest, but it's sure, if, as you all know, if we don't keep track of that, we will, we will not be able to accomplish the core mission. So um, I would see that this, this, the responsibility is really pointed externally, and we, I think it's a combination of external and internal. Okay. Um, the other place that might be helpful to look at is just our, the, the commission's vast broad powers under section four of 23K that might present some thoughts for a little bit of a checklist for you in Austin to think about um, <clears throat> and certain, certainly like for instance, our mitigation obligations mm -hmm. that extend beyond even um, responsible gaming that's so, but also in terms of uh, public safety and, um, community, and uh, mitigation. community. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, I had one more thought. I was wondering if we could incorporate, um, you know, somewhere in this, the obligation and the responsibility to regulate racing, horse racing. Oh, that's good. Yep. I really yeah. mention anything but gaming here, and I just thought there'd be a place to just, because yeah. that's a, a regu uh, rather responsibility we take very seriously and have spent a lot of time and effort with. So we, I think there's a we way to include. Play. Yes, absolutely. We should include simulcasting as well, right? Yes. Okay. Right. Excellent, thank you, Commissioner Cameron. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien, do you have additional thoughts? No, I'm good, thanks. Okay, Commissioner, Z Commissioner Zuniga? Okay, so it's all clear, right, Austin? <laughs> <laughs> well, so I think the plan is we'll take a stab at that and we can you know, bring it back for the commission for final approval um, once we get uh, a draft done. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I would also check in with uh, Todd. You probably are thinking of some thoughts um, as as you consider this, you and your team. Um, for instance, we, I, you know, I think we have some affirmative obligation that might be um, with respect to, you know, external um, stakeholders like the lottery and um, our, the the tribal interests. So uh, again, um, whether we incorporate them all or reference it in the general terms, we would just want to think about those obligations as well, responsibilities. Okay. okay, that's the beginning of the exercise, Karen. I think that's probably yeah. a good start that's, and then- That's helpful. And if we have language, we can, we can get it over to uh, you. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I am all set, thank you. All right, I just have to scroll down here. Um, I had teased at the beginning that when we encouraged Karen at our last meeting as part of her review to delegate, I didn't know that she was going to delegate <laughs> to us. <laughs> okay, um, item number four. Um, this is Nikisha Skinner's first presentation since she's been hired vir and, and only virtually. We've never met, I've never met Nikisha in person. I know some of us have. So uh, good morning, Nikisha, and uh, this is, um, we have seen you and you've certainly spoken in public, but this is your first um, presentation, formal presentation, so thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and everyone. Um, the MGM position for you to consider today is the warehouse driver attendant. Um, this position is pretty much identical to the warehouse attendant position that the commission exempted back on February 22nd, 2018, except the difference between the two positions is this one is responsible for transporting, excuse me, transporting mer merchandise and the other, um, the warehouse attendant position that was already exempted 
um, has no driving responsibilities. Um, but like the earlier uh, exempted position, this warehouse driver attendant has no role on the gaming floor and has no access to secure areas without a security escort. Um, individuals in the position do not receive or handle gaming equipment or slot machines. Um, they both report to a, um, an SER position, so the manager of uh, the supervisor, excuse me, of uh, these two uh, individuals, in particular the warehouse driver attendant position that's before you today, um, is registered as a service employee. Um, so it is my recommendation that the commission exempt this position, warehouse driver attendant, from the registration requirements, as is the driver, excuse me, the warehouse attendant position. And that is all I have. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Great. Um, Commissioner, so you shifted slightly. There's Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Cameron. Uh, yes. Um, um, you know, I think this was a thoughtful um, presentation looking at a very similar position and making the, the comparison that they, there are no um, additional responsibilities that would in any way impact our decision here because it's, it's very similar to the warehouse position as, as, uh, as Director Skinner just pointed out. So I, I appreciate the, uh, the comparison work and the thoughtful um, you know, analysis of all of the things that would give us pause in in um, in considering this. So I I have no pause. I see no issue at all with uh, exempting this position. Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner O'Brien. Just Zuniga. Same same here. Um, I think it's well articulated in the memo and in the remarks. Uh, so I'm, I support the recommendation. Okay. Commissioner O'Brien, all set? Yeah, I'm all set. I think it's very similar to the one we approved most recently, so. Director Skinner, thank you um, so much for the thoughtful um, memorandum. Um, I think that this is a recommendation does in fact reflect the, um, the intent of the statutory change to um, give some ease to make sure that um, we don't create unnecessary barriers for jobs. So um, I'm all set, but I do need, you need a vote, correct? And, and I, yes, please. And Madam Chair and Commissioners, I just have to make one correction. I've been referring to this position incorrectly as the warehouse driver attendant. The way it's written, it's driver attendant uh, for warehouse receiving. So just that small clarification before you take the vote, please. Okay, thank you. And, and is that correction clear, everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Do I have a motion then? Commissioner O'Brien? Um, certainly. Madam Chair, I move that the Commission exempt the driver attendant for warehouse receiving position at MGM Springfield from the registration requirements in accordance with 205 CMR 134.031B for the reasons discussed and described in the Commissioner's packet and here today. Second. Any further questions or edits? Commissioner Zuniga, you're all set? All right, then we'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. I vote yes, Vivian four zero. And thank you, Director Skinner. Thank you. Nice to see you. All right. And I am looking forward to our first in-person meeting, hopefully sooner than later. All right. Um, moving on to item number five. Um, <clears throat> IEB, Director Lilios, please. Okay, good morning again. So the first item under number five is uh, asking you to consider a request from the two category one casinos from Encore and MGM. They have requested to expand the blackjack style tables to include a fourth player position. And the blackjack style tables are used obviously for the game of blackjack, but also for other games, uh, notably uh, Baccarat and, and Pai Gao, for example. And since the properties reopened in early July after the COVID closure, the, 
they have been operating under your requirements of a maximum of three players per blackjack style table. So this would mean one additional seat. Uh, we did check with uh, other jurisdictions to see what they are doing. Uh, and it, uh, we would not be an outlier uh, either way. Uh, New Jersey allows up to six positions at blackjack style tables, so long as they are separated by plexiglass. New York, Maryland, and Pennsylvania allow four positions with plexiglass. And at our last check, Rhode Island and Connecticut remain at three positions with plexiglass. Uh, there are some suggested minimum requirements uh, for you to consider. And I think I will uh, try to share uh, my document here uh, for you to take a look at. Um, so here are some suggested minimum requirements should you determine to allow the request on the fourth uh, player position. So this uh, would, uh, positions would continue to be separated by plexiglass, separating the dealer from the players and the players uh, from one another. The distance between the players would now be three feet approximately from center to center of seat. Uh, and when I say now, I mean with the fourth position, currently the seats are about four feet, of, feet apart. Uh, overall capacity limits for the properties would remain capped where they are now. This would not be um, increasing the overall capacity limits and all the other health and safety measures uh, would be uh, in place. I should mention that we have consulted with DPH, which we are required to do before an expansion like this uh, is made. Uh, and for the next item as well, we've done that consultation uh, and no objections were lodged uh, with, with DPH uh, with these types of requirements attached to it. Uh, so myself and Bruce are, are here. We will try to uh, answer, address any uh, questions or issues that you have. Uh, but essentially that is that is the request. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Loretta, if we could go back to the other screen so I could see all the commissioners. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Thank you. It just makes it easier for me. Thanks. Commissioner, who would like to go first for questions for Loretta? Commissioner Zuniga? Thank you. Yeah, I can... Um... Uh, Loretta, um, we've spoken in the past uh, in your updates um, about um, compliance with mask wearing and, um, uh, you know, which I think relevant to also perhaps mention uh, here, but if you could also expound on what we've observed relative to congregation around tables by observers, sometimes it's observers, sometimes it's companions, how people are coming to the casino in pairs or or, or other smaller groups, and whether this would either facilitate or address some of that, um, you know, if, if there's anything you can share on that, on that aspect might be uh, helpful. Sure, sure. So there is an overall mandate of, you know, six feet distancing while, and, and no congregating. And on the minimum requirements for the next item, we have specifically included uh, enforcement of the no congregating of uh, observers because the game of craps typically um, it, it lends itself more to that uh, uh, than some of the other games. Uh, but you know, the casinos, they've got an all hands on deck approach to the congregating uh, item. Uh, you've seen that, we've talked about it uh, in the ingress and egress, you know, elevators, that kind of thing, but it's also been one of the significant efforts on the floor. Uh, so that effort would, would remain in place. Uh, the fourth seat, the way I uh, understand it for these um, blackjack style tables is really gives options to patrons who may be traveling in a group of three or four or two couples, also gives the casino some flexibility around the, uh, um, the dollar limit, managing the dollar limits at tables. Uh, there is, um, uh, it, it, it hasn't been explained as an effort to offer fewer tables, but rather expand the offer options for 
players and expand the opportunities to manage those uh, dollar limits at the tables. Uh, so Lamed, I don't know, I does think, that address I, your? Loretta, I think Bruce might have raised his hand. I'm not sure, Bruce, if you could yeah. add to Loretta or? I, they, they do an excellent job of, of trying to stop people from con congregating around the tables. Uh, you know, that, that's always happened in this industry, especially if somebody starts to, to bet large amounts and stuff. So that they make a concerted effort to keep people moving and, and stuff. That That's also true, like with roulette, when people do it, are doing that. So they keep people moving, you know, as well as I do. They do that with craps as well, and they will keep people moving around that. Uh, I, I can add here that with uh, uh, for Encore, for instance, the uh, fourth spot will, will create uh, extra 182 positions to uh, bet from. And at uh, MGM, it creates, uh, I think it was an additional 48 positions for their tables to, to, gam uh, to gamble at. So like Loretta said, it's not you know, closing tables or anything like that, but it's creating extra positions for uh, people to sit at at the tables. So if you bring with friends, you are more likely to be able to sit together. Loretta, are you, um, Commissioner Zuniga, um, do you have additional questions that you'd like to ask? No, uh, that's, uh, thank you. Right now? That's good. Okay, for I'm right good. now? I'm good for now. Okay, for good. Uh, this is still just on the blackjack uh, fourth position. Blackjack style, excuse me. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Bruce, the, we have the licensees have the uh, ability to serve alcohol, obviously, when people are actively gaming. And there was a, a lot of discussion early on in June when we were trying to come up with these guidelines about masks up or down, pulling them up or down, what's the best thing to do. And I know it's come to everyone's attention now through the research that a lot of this is aerosolized transmission. <clears throat> so maybe some of the touch point concerns about moving a mask, <clears throat> excuse me, are not as uh, prominent as they were back in June. But it's my understanding that when people are served their drinks, it essentially the mask will come down as you're, you know, working on your drink and, and actively gaming. Is that a fair description? Yes, uh, as they're seated, yes, at the okay. table, yes. Um, and it, there are new gaming positions that would be added by this, but are any other jobs going to be created in terms of adding a seat at the blackjack table? At, at the blackjack table, no, because you're not adding additional tables. Right. Uh, but there will be none, you know, lost as, as a result. Like, like I say, on Saturdays when they get these good sized crowds, it will create extra places for people to sit and play the game instead of kind of walking around and not having a place to play. Right. I, I just, my, one of my concerns that I have is, um, which I, maybe I can save some of them for, um, you know, defer to when Commissioner Cameron and you, Madam Chair, ask your questions, but I, I have some concerns about taking what we establish as the minimum space, kind of seat to seat as we set this up in June and, and putting people closer together. Um, the governor's opened up a lot of things re recently and there are, time limit caps on some other places that are just not practical for casinos. 90 minutes is just not practical. Um, and I really don't see any way I've thought about, there's no way to do that. It's just not a, a part of this equation. So it's really just saying we want to put another body at a table. Um, and I have concerns about, in particular, the mask being down in that environment, probably more likely near people that are not part of your bubble and part of your party, as, as would be in a restaurant. Um, I know the ventilation systems are excellent. They've had excellent compliance. I have absolutely no doubt licensees would continue to do that. Um, but I have huge hesitations right now. I, I may feel differently in you know, two, three, four weeks as we do more of this opening up. But um, I, I have some concerns on the, the blackjack additional seat request. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, I don't have questions, but I do have, um, uh, I think my concerns are minimized. Uh, uh, by the fact that the licensees have really worked hard to um, to keep it safe and and really work hard to make sure they are uh, adhering to all of our guidelines and we have not seen um, uh, events where the virus has spread and also the fact that when um, 
Assistant Director Ban started his discussion today in talking about uh, the percentages. We're still not seeing anything close to a 40% in the uh, in the casino. So I think my concerns are really um, minimized by those facts when it comes to making a decision like this. And the plexiglass, I do think, is uh, is really making a difference. If I could just add on to Commissioner Cameron's point, um, I, I too, I want to remind um, ourselves and the public that plexiglass will continue to divide the players um, be, among themselves, so if it were be, to become four, as well as with the, the, um, the dealer. The dealer's mask and shield, if they choose to wear a shield as well, are always on, correct? Um, Loretta, um, Director Milios. That, that's right. We have the mass requirement throughout for the dealer. And then a reminder, um, and this is actually was um, something that was given to us through the public health guidance was that at the on the casino floors, and this is still the practice, no one can have a drink and move around with a drink in their hand. Oh, they can only have a drink if they are seated with the protection of plexiglass and actively gaming so that their mask is down. And the idea of why the mask doesn't go back up is because they're not constantly touching their face back and forth. So there's, there's some guidance in, um, that we relied on on that. So what really would be happening is we'd have an additional player and to Commissioner O'Brien's point, they're just gonna be, they would become closer. They would, rather than that extra foot of space between the the plexiglass, I guess it would be the equivalent of six inches on each side, if it's a, a foot, right? Um, that we're, re, we're reducing it. Maybe my math is wrong, forgive me. But we have the idea um, that it's the plexiglass. It would be um, from the front seat, the middle of the, the center seat, it's a foot now, three feet rather than four feet. So it'd be, I guess, a six inch reduction on each side. I guess I was right. Um, <clears throat> And now what I'm hearing is that it's a uh, revenue driver. What I'm hearing is it's not a job driver um, on this particular. Uh, Chair, on, on that point, um, if I can jump in, the addition of the seat in those positions to the numbers that Bruce talked about, that does open up the opportunity uh, for um, some additional needs for cocktail servers. Uh, because you know the limits on the beverages are well seated. So there could be, um, and I, I have some communication now with Encore uh, that it, it would result in uh, more cocktail servers because of the limit, you know, you have to be gaming uh, to do it. So it could result in, in is expected to result in the cocktail server. And Very do they helpful. have a number on that, Loretta? Um, we'll see if we get a number on that. <laughs> We're in communication now. I figured it was real time, and we can continue our conversation while they give us that if they if they're able to. I'm sure it would be an estimate, but uh, um, I think uh, to build on Commissioner Cameron's uh, level of comfort, um, given the uh, decisions in Massachusetts, which I uh, remain confident continue to be data driven uh, decisions, uh, my level of comfort on expanding this these uh, gaming positions is pretty high. Um, we are continuing to assume a degree of risk. I knocked on wood when I, I heard how uh, Commissioner Cameron reflect on how we have been fortunate. Uh, but I do credit the enforcement measures of um, our team, but also the vigilance and compliance of the licensees. So, um, <clears throat> Director Lilios, I assume that we're not quite hearing from Encore on the numbers. Are there other questions for Bruce or Loretta on this proposal for the expanded um, seat? I, and I can jump in now, as you said, it's real-time communication. Yes. So the estimate is um, that it would impact the cocktail servers and food and beverage, uh, 20 cocktail servers and an additional 60 on the food and beverage. Theoretically, we could and we could extrapolate that to the other establishments too. To, you know, they would be, of course, of different scale. And is that, I, 
food and beverages based on um, because they are presuming that they would then have other amenities and opening. I believe so. Yes. On the floor. I believe so. Yes. Commissioner Zimika, do you want to add in? Yeah. Um, thank you. Like uh, like yourself and, and Commissioner Cameron, I'm um, I, I understand that this is not a riskless um, uh, move, but I'm I'm comforted with the measures that and the thought and compliance that we've seen, you know, in the past. I I also think of it, even though it is um, perhaps um, tempting to think that one seed will always mean one more body. I think the notion of how how the, the hours and, 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 and maybe what, what Bruce was talking about, the, the desire to offer different options is also uh, at play here. And so um, we may see that just maybe now one, um, the same player tries two tables or, or comes or is able to sit with their companion as opposed to necessarily an incremental body. And, 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 I, and I say that with all the other met measures that we've been um, hearing about relative to how we continue to see, um, you know, uh, even in, in, in promotion days, not a, not a, nothing close to the limit in terms of overall occupancy, which is another big, big driver that, and, and a point that Commissioner Cameron also made. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of, of, um, or of approving this uh, request and, and, and would want to continue to see the updates that, uh, that we get um, as we have been doing the, uh, these since, um, since the beginning. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, you're nodding. Do you want to add in or are you all set? Uh, I'm all set. I'd be happy to make a motion. Let me just check in with Commissioner O'Brien. Uh, any other observation you want to share with us, please? No, I, I, I've expressed my um, discomfort with this at the, in terms of the timing in particular, given that we just reopened. Um, the variant that's out there, the uncertainty in the next two, three, four weeks, to me, it's not an appropriate time to do this, but we can absolutely bring the motion and go. Okay. Um, with that, Commissioner Cameron. Um, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission amend item 10B of the previously adopted document entitled Minimum Requirements for the initial uh, phase three opening of gaming establishments to allow for up to four player positions at each blackjack style table subject to the minimum requirements outlined in the memorandum in the commissioner's packet as discussed here today. Second. Okay, any further questions or edits for that particular motion? All right, uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Nay. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes. So that's three ayes and one nay. Vivian, thank you. And, and thank you everyone um, for the very thoughtful discussion. Appreciate it. Moving on then, Loretta, to item number 5B. Okay, so this is uh, a request again from Encore and MGM to reintroduce the game of crafts. All of the other jurisdictions that we surveyed, including Rhode Island and Connecticut, currently offer crafts. Um, let's see. Uh, the pro proposal, and I'm going to try to share again, I think it may be helpful for, uh, for the public. Um, uh, the proposal is accompanied by some suggested requirements that there is a maximum of six players per craps table with three players maximum on each side of the table. Players would be required to remain seated while gaming and no congregating around the tables. We've already discussed that. Uh, there would be plexiglass on the tables, players separated from one another by plexiglass. Uh, barriers uh, and the dealers at, uh, uh, at the table are separated from plexiglass as well. Uh, dice would be sanitized between shooters and the IEB would approve the uh, layout uh, of each uh, crafts table in advance. Again, overall capacity would be capped at 40%. And uh, there would be uh, a change to the internal controls requiring that all bets be placed before the dice are sent out with signage on the table 
uh, to that effect. Um, again, all the other health and safety measures and the masking, uh, for instance, would remain in place. And we'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have on that as you continue your deliberations. Who would like to go first, Commissioner Zinnega? Uh, thank you. I do have a couple of questions, um, perhaps uh, for, for Bruce, but I'll start, uh, Loretta, with um, in your surveying of other jurisdictions. Um, did you ascertain um, that layout, um, whether they have different layouts, or is it typically three layers per size, per side of table that you've seen? I think there's a variance, but the, and I'm going to turn it to Bruce. There's yeah. um, something uh, pretty special about the uh, plexi alternative yeah. here, but Bruce, I think you're in a better I, position to, to describe I would say that. the layout that we had was probably the most protective, not only for the patrons, but also for the employees. Uh, uh, ours were probably the only ones that also slanted in somewhat that allows people to look down as the dice kind of gets thrown. Uh, most of, of them are straight up and down. Where you, you kind of bang your head if you try, try and uh, uh, look in. But uh, uh, it it was very ni nicely done. Uh, some of the others in other jurisdictions had no glass directly in front of the players, which uh, I didn't think was a very good setup at all uh, uh, with it, where ours, ours does. Uh, it was good setup. I will add in here too that uh, uh, when I spoke to Encore, that for them to set up seven tables, uh, it would take 110 dealers and supervisors to run the, the uh, all seven tables. Uh, and with MGM, uh, for their two tables, it would take 32 dealers and supervisors to do that. I don't know if they're all new employees, but essentially to run the blackjack tables and everything, eventually it would, you know, include that. So. I thought I should add that in the conversation as well. Thank you. I, I had a, a follow-up, or not, not a follow-up, but a second question. Sure, go um, ahead. With that you alluded to, perhaps, uh, Loretta, with um, with placing all the bets before the throw. Uh, is it is it fair to say that the game will effectively be slower than a regular game prior to pandemic, or is it not necessarily? No, it, Bruce, it's actually, Bruce, I'm going to kick that to you. Yeah, it actually becomes a safer game. Uh, you know, for one, uh, verbal wagers uh, is usually when most people take their, their shots at the, the casino is they do it right before the dice fall and they, you know, say, you know, they're going to place it on the six or something like that. This kind of protects the casino and especially with the plexiglass there, it's hard for the, the dealers and, and everybody to hear that kind of a wager. So that was one of the big conditions that uh, we placed on, on them to, to protect the game. So I think it will actually speed the game up. Uh, actually. Interesting. Thank you. I think Commissioner O'Brien was leaning in next. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Yep. Commissioner O'Brien. Um, I'm sure I'm asking too much because I can't find it, so I shouldn't be asking you guys this, but I know we saw graphics and photos of what this looks like when we, you know, when this sort of first came up as a possibility even back um, when we decided not to let it um, be on the floor when it reopened in July. I don't suppose anybody has those graphics. I do think it's helpful to to Bruce's yes. point, you do. He's Excellent. waving his hand. Yeah, um, either to show Bruce exactly. or Bruce. Yeah. Always the ready. Provided to everyone in this setup. It's because it's hard to imagine, but we have seen this before. Yeah. Yes. Thank uh, you. Um, and then, it, in terms of saving time, Loretta. Also, I know um, the discussion about adding jobs to adding a seat at the blackjack tables. Whether there would be a concomitant gain in cocktail server and/or food service jobs in connection with the 110 extra at EVH for craps, if you're communicating with Jackie, if she might have a, a ballpark on that, or whether it's that same number with adding a fourth seat at the blackjack table. Right, and we'll just keep in mind that when we get the numbers from Encore, we can extrapolate for um, MGM. Um, kind of can everybody scale. see what I'm sharing? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I will share a couple different pictures here. So this is Encore's uh, slide, that they have currently eight crap yes. tables. Thank you. Yes. And MGM has how many? Uh, they, they're going to have uh, two tables and that if it gets passed, they wouldn't have theirs till the 16th. 
Encore would have two tables by the end of night tonight, and they would have seven by, uh, I think it said this weekend or, or next week. But you can see the dis uh, distance between the seats. Mm -hmm. Oops, that's a roulette <laughs> table, so I went too far. No, that's okay. That's yeah. roulette. So if you could go yeah. back Wait. there. Yeah. That's the slanted um, view, yeah. right? That you yes. were referring to, Bruce. Yeah, right here you can see. And it allows, and the glass is, you can see the emblem on here, but the glass comes back pretty far uh, in here. You can see it here. It goes all. So the way you mean in terms here. of separating the individual players? Is that what? Yes, you mean? exactly. Glass and, is pretty, pretty clear. Yeah. But it, like I say, it allows the player to kind of lean, lean in to look down the, uh, the table, which is is nice if you're a craps player. To see the dice. So and yes. and it's three players on each side. Each, and remind us end. again on um, each end and remind us the distance between the um, it's ends. It's four feet between each. Four feet. Between each player and the distance between yeah. each end and of the table. Yes, okay. and there will be chairs all along here. I think I have a picture with, yeah. Yeah, they have to be seated. But this right. table is particularly long, correct? Um, it's 12, 12 foot long. Yeah, so there's a good distance between the, the two sets yes. of three players. Yes. And they're also separated by by plexiglass because there's course. you yeah. know there right. is um yes yeah right yeah and then bruce i know they've done a good job in terms of making sure people don't gather um i think yes. you've commented on this before we've talked about this craps amongst all the games usually draws the most that, by that, and so yeah. I, I know they've been really good about this but if you had conversations about the fact we, this will be an additional challenge in terms of they, they are well aware of it, how much we're going to be monitoring this and uh, uh, they I'm sure will be on top of this because it's it's something they really want and I think I said this at the last meeting it's also the game that I get most questions about from the public mm -hmm. uh, right and and neighboring jurisdictions have I think Loretta you said this for the most part are allowing crafts at this point yes yes uh, and actually with a lot more numbers than what you know, we're, they're asking for uh, up with it. I wouldn't allow it right now with a lot more numbers by any means, but. Uh. It, it, it's been, it's, yeah. it's so a, a couple things. It's been explained to me that some players are craps only players. So yeah. they haven't been playing in Massachusetts at all. And so it's been explained to me that this would be an opportunity to you know, recapture uh, those uh, patrons in, in that revenue. And with respect to the question about uh, increases in uh, staffing, so in addition to the numbers that Bruce gave you, which are more dealer-based uh, for uh, craps, the cocktail server and food and beverage increases, if craps were brought back, would be incremental only to the numbers that you heard uh, previously, okay. the 20 and the 60. Okay, thank you. Can you just remind me, I'm sorry, because my document isn't up, the number that Encore expects to, of new dealers if um, craps is reintroduced? 110. Yeah, I One thought ten. I heard 110. I, I heard, thought I heard 90 before, Loretta, maybe in earlier discussions with you, but it's 110 from Encore. So MGM would have a very different number because they've only got a couple tables, but obviously it's a job generator. Um, yeah. And, and um, for future, I don't need this now, but I think in connection with our earlier uh, discussion about making sure that women who have these incredibly good jobs are able to re be reintroduced, this is an opportunity. Um, I'd love to know that we we have a good number of women crafts dealers. Uh, Commissioner Cameron, would you have insight on that at this point? Uh, would I have insight on that? I don't on think women, I could, on women. I, I, Perhaps I dealers. think it's a great idea that you mention it, though, because I Good. think it's, it's so if we could remind uh, uh, the licensees how important this is. Um, yeah. And, I, yeah. and I think they will pay attention, but I just think it's really yeah. important. So, but, uh, this um, is, yeah, and this builds on Commissioner O'Brien's earliest point, which is if this many new uh, positions are coming in, let's make sure we haven't created unfair barriers. Mm -hmm. So, Commissioner great. Cameron? Yeah, I had one additional follow-up to Commissioner O'Brien's uh, question. 
uh, for assistant director band in your discussion with colleagues around the country who now offer crafts is there a challenge in keeping because it is a spectator kind of a game uh, is it is it a challenge for them to keep those um, spectators from coming in and watching uh, you know watching the game as it's being played well, I can't say that every jurisdiction tries to do that okay uh, but I I don't think it is that that much if you know there's always somewhat of a challenge to do that everywhere but I think if you have people that walk around and keep saying you know got to move on, move along uh, I know that MGM plans to put it to cap off the end of their pit so that's pretty easy to keep cleared and where uh, Encore keeps their craps tables they're all in one location in front of the cage it's pretty easy to keep those people moving around too because there's personnel right there they only have one table upstairs so okay thanks commissioner zunica do you have a further questions no no i um i'd say i um i was able to to look at a layout uh, back last summer when they first started thinking about this um, yeah, and I visited Encore, um, and um, you know, the, the the one of the one of the staff um, demonstrated, you know, shooting the dice and 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 with with the plexiglass, which was hard for me to imagine before, uh, you know, before then. Um, so it's 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 very the, the layout I think is is rather uh, creative, trying to preserve the game. Um, and, uh, and 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 insert all the precautions that we, you know, we've been talking about for 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 a while now. So I'm I'm comforted with um, with the request in in, in this case. Um, I do have to say that the challenge will come on the observation uh, on the people that like to observe the game, as 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 a person who likes to observe the games when they go this game in particular when they go to the casino. Um, but um, but I think this goes back to uh, the emphasis um, that we've observed in terms of from the casino operators in terms of their compliance efforts. Um, so again, I would I would be um, I'm in favor of their of, of authorizing this request. Other further questions on the request to expand into craps. No, my final um, comment really is just reflects what I said earlier. Again, there's a lot of comfort in knowing that our um, enforcement measures are um, you know, heightened with our gaming agents there and our GEU. And I just think we will continue to rely on the compliance efforts of the, of the two licensees here. So uh, thank you. Um, you will need a vote on on this one as well, uh, Director Lilios? Correct. Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I would move that the Commission amend item 10C of the previously adopted document entitled um, Minimum Requirements for the Initial Phase 3 Opening of Gaming Establishments to allow for the game of craps to be offered subject to the minimum requirements outlined in the memorandum of the commissioner's packet today uh, uh, for this meeting and discussed here today. Second. Thank, Thank you. Any further comments, edits? All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. And I vote yes, Vivian, four zero on the uh, Craps reopening. Thank you, and thank you uh, to both Bruce and Loretta for really teeing that up so nicely. We appreciate Thanks. it. Great, thank you. Thank you, okay. Madam Chair. Could we? Could I ask for a five-minute break? Before absolutely. We move to the next absolutely. Item? Before we turn it over to um, um, Kate, and of course, I do have in mind that we have um, one commissioner that needs to leave at one, but it looks like we're in good good um, standing. So we will return back around 1, uh, 1120. Does that make sense? That's a nine Sounds minute good. break. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Um, I think um, we have everybody here. We'll just do a quick roll call. Uh, commissioners, Commissioner Cameron. I'm here. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. I'm here. And Commissioner Zuniga. Here. And there we are, Vivian. You have us all. 
Um, and before we get started, I now see that Kate, um, who is our senior enforcement counsel, will give her report on a qualifier um, determination of suitability. I do have a disclosure to make um, in accordance with our obligations under our, our enhanced um, code of ethics. Um, <clears throat> out of an abundance of caution, I filed yesterday with my appointing official, the governor, um, a 23B3 disclosure indicating that um, <clears throat> this particular qualifier's former employer is my son and my daughter's current employer um, in Los Angeles. And um, <clears throat> I was able, I learned this fact uh, when uh, the new director uh, was announced publicly in November. Um, inadvertently, my son just happened to ask if in any way it affected my work. So I learned that this gentleman um, had uh, previously worked at CAA where my son works and my son had had limited, um, but some professional interactions with uh, this new director. My daughter, on the other hand, um, did not have any interactions and doesn't know him. I also learned that my daughter-in-law um, had become acquainted with this gentleman and had one limited professional um, interaction with him. I think on a, a, he might have served on a panel that she um, that she with others brought together. So I disclosed that um, I I feel that. Um, I'm one of four making a decision today. Uh, it's a decision that's important to this uh, qualifier, uh, but I feel given the limited uh, um, interactions that were made and that I had never known of this individual or heard of this individual prior to this announcement um, that I can be fair and objective in, in my evaluation. And I have um, now read the report after making that filing. Todd, you have a copy of it. If you could distribute it to um, my uh, fellow commissioners, that would be great. So I think that we can proceed, um, Kate, unless there's questions from my fellow commissioners. Okay, I've seen um, um, no, so let's proceed. Thanks so much, uh, Kate. And again, thank you for, um, for your presentation today. Certainly, good morning. Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. It's lovely to see everybody. Uh, the qualifier for your consideration today is Mr. Darnell Strom. He's a qualifier by virtue of his position on the uh, WIN Board of Directors. Uh, Mr. Strom has submitted all of the required forms and complied with all of the IEB's requests for supplemental and updated information. The IEB was able to conduct its complete protocol for suitability for casino qualifiers and was able to confirm financial stability and integrity, review litigation history, criminal history, uh, and also verify that no prohibited political contributions were made in Massachusetts, in addition to conducting checks of open source and law enforcement databases as part of the investigation. The team of investigators who are joining me on this call was Lieutenant Kevin Murphy of the Massachusetts State Police Gaming Enforcement Unit and supervising financial investigator Monica Chang. Investigators were able to interview Mr. Strom using virtual technology on January 14th of 2021, and Lieutenant Murphy and Ms. Chang conducted that interview. Uh, Mr. Strom was noted to be cooperative and forthcoming in all aspects of this investigation. In October of 2020, Mr. Strom was appointed to the Wynn Resorts Limited Board of Directors. Prior to this appointment, he was employed with the Democratic National Convention Committee from September of 2003 to August of 2004. He then worked for the Kerry Edwards presidential campaign from August of 2004 through December of 2004, and then the office of former President William Clinton and the William Clinton Foundation from October of 2006 to December of 2009. It was at that point that Mr. Strom transitioned out of politics as a career and began a career in the entertainment industry. Uh, he began employment with CAA, a talent agency based in Los Angeles, and worked there from January of 2010 January of 2019. And in 2019, Mr. Strom took a position with the United Talent Agency. He's currently a partner and head of the Culture and Leadership Division at UTA. And it was while at UTA that Mr. Strom became aware of the opening on the Wynn Board of Directors during a conversation with Matthew Maddox, the CEO of Wynn Resorts. Uh, 
Um, in his role as an independent director, Mr. Strom serves on the nominating and corporate governance committee, as well as the audit committee. As a member of the nominating and corporate governance committee, Mr. Strom and the other members of this committee are responsible for identifying and evaluating potential director nominees and periodically assessing the desired qualifications, attributes, skills, and experience of directors. Uh, Mr. Strom's duties as a member of the audit committee include participating in the appointment, compensation, and retention of independent auditors, as well as the approval of audit engagement fees and terms. A background review was able to confirm that Mr. Strom graduated from Piedmont Hills High School in San Jose, California in 1999. Following high school, he enrolled at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee, Florida, and graduated in 2003 with a Bachelor of Science degree in political science. It's noted that Mr. Strom does not have any gaming-related licenses or registrations. However, he is in the process of submitting personal applications to the following jurisdictions. New Jersey, Colorado, Indiana, and Michigan. It should be noted that Massachusetts is the first jurisdiction to interview him for qualification purposes in connection with his new role with Wind Resorts Limited. Mr. Strom has demonstrated to the IEB by clear and convincing evidence that he is suitable, and the IEB recommends that the commission vote to find him suitable as a qualifier for Wind Mass LLC. Any questions? Commissioners. Any questions for Kate on this particular report? Commissioner Cameron. Um, I don't have any questions because it was such a clean report. In fact, I don't, I've read very few that are this clean. There were no need for any follow-up questions because the, the report was so precise and, um, and there were just no questions because it is so clean a report. Thank you. Any, any other comments or questions? All right, then we do need a vote. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to make a motion that, um, that the commission issue a positive determination of suitability to Donnell Strom as a member of the Board of Directors for Wynn Resorts Limited. Second. Thank you. No uh, edits or questions? Then our um, roll call vote, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Uh, Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Sunica. Aye. And I vote yes, four zero, Vivian, thank you. All right. Just, uh, just a note that um, uh, I take note that um, Wynn Resorts does continue to diversify their board and um, that was a subject that was discussed earlier, and uh, I just take note and give him credit for that. Thank you, Commissioner Cameron. It's a really important point um, that uh, that they're leading with that diversity today, and and um, we have, we know that that will make it only a richer conversation at the table. So thank you. All right, um, then we're going. We can thank Kate and thank uh, Loretta Lilios for um, leading item number five. Thank you so much. Thank you, and my thanks to the investigators, to Lieutenant Murphy and, and Monica Chang for a great job, team effort, Absol thanks. Yeah, excellent, excellent work and, and uh, great timing too, thank you so much. All right, moving on then to item number six. Commissioner O'Brien, you've been leading this. This is now on, on day two of the overall evaluation in our um, obligation to address compensation of the executive director. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This was put on for this date. There was some conversation about um, getting historical context for some of the figures that are in the sheet that's in the packet in terms of showing what past executive directors have been paid um, and then salary bumps versus sort of, you know, adjustments to their base. Um, I will start out by saying that um, in terms of, in, in particularly in relation to Karen, which is what the vote would be for today, um, I think she's doing an outstanding job. I do think we should have a further conversation about where the base salary is in connection with not only past history, but also other government agencies and other gaming commissions. Um, but I do feel that given the economic situation of our licensees and the pandemic, and the situation of the other employees, it, it would not be my recommendation um, that we change what her base pay is at this time, that I think it should remain and we then move forward 
um, knowing full well that as, as we recover and as we see where we are at the end of the year and we approach our next evaluation, hopefully she's still with us and hasn't decided to go off to bigger and better things, um, that of course does not foreclose the option of a retroactive um, action. But I think at this time, the salary is appropriate given the history that I'm aware of. But I do know that Commissioner Zuniga commented on there is historical context for some of this. And so I'm also um, eager to hear what that was today. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, I'm, I'm sorry if I have missed this, but I'm not sure of the exact amount we're talking about. Was she brought up to, did we, um, when she became? So my understanding is, and if Tripti's on the call, it was 185 was what we brought her on up to Thanks. when she was made the full-time executive director and moved away from the acting position. Inter from the interim. I just wanted to make sure I was right on that. So as of, it was September when uh, she was made the full-time. Uh, so as of September, she was paid um, at the 185. And prior to that, when she became interim in January, there was a, a lesser amount, of a, a minimum lesser amount, but certainly a lesser amount. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, Commissioner Zinnika. Sure, let me follow up with um, with that with, with the comments from last time and now. Um, my uh, my my recollection of of uh, the first hire of executive director um, was that we were willing and in fact uh, probably did pay a premium for um, what we needed at the time, which was. Um, a big emphasis on game, regulatory gaming experience, uh, and that de facto meant uh, uh, the need to attract somebody from out of state. Just given where we were in the arc uh, of history of the of the commission, um, we uh, we also you know to continue in the in the trajectory um, of of the, the subsequent uh, salaries of the executive director. Um, the the instances in which we uh, decided to uh, to give not a not a um, just a, a bonus, if you will, uh, a, a one-time um, uh, increase in the salary, uh, I think we did that twice for Mr. Bedrosian, was at the time uh, also a desire to try to manage, um, you know, the the base uh, compared to other um, state agencies, um, uh, as we are um, on the. We were on the uh, perhaps um, higher end of, of a range, uh, and that, by the way, that comparison is always tricky, even in the state that there's independence, there's uh, you know state agencies as as well as um, um, you know executive agencies that that have very different uh, base scales, uh, even in the same context. Um, that's that's by way of uh, historical context. I can I can move to how I feel about it now, but or or I can try to shed some more light. Oh, perhaps before I do that, um, I think the comparison is um, that's in the packet is is very appropriate. I would note uh, a couple of things, uh, which which were also a, a bit of a factor back back then when we when we hired the first executive director. The two um, gaming jurisdictions that have um, a higher salary than where we are, that are noted in the memo, Nevada and uh, Pennsylvania, are uh, the first, the, the, um, the largest and the second largest gaming markets in the United States, um, with um, many, many casinos in the case of Nevada, and, and at least um, you know, 11 last time I looked, uh, and that was prior to the introduction of mini okay. casinos and, and sports betting, mm -hmm. as well as uh, a lot of online playing in, in, in Pennsylvania. Um, again, which is the second largest market. Um, my um, recollection from our consultants' um, um, conversations relative to fair comparisons, or actually in terms of size, and I, by the way, I, I, I put that fair a word uh, in, you know, in, in quotes because um, it's very difficult to do a one-to-one -one comparison uh, because there's any number of things um, that go into the regulatory agencies from one state to the next. That's something that we struggle when we compare, try to compare regulatory costs versus gaming activity. It always depends on how other things are 
are, are, are quantified and allowed in the state, et cetera. But um, Michigan uh, was uh, uh, and the, at the time, and, 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 and you know, and I think um, perhaps still um, something that in terms of size is perhaps a good comparison um, because there's also three large uh, resorts. There's a relationship with a tribe in the case of Michigan, many, uh, several tribes in the case of Michigan, uh, several more. Um, but this is where the comparison begin, begin to, to be um, not apples to apples because um, the cost of living, of course, may be very different between uh, Detroit, let's say, and, and, and Boston. Um, other things begin to be uh, worthy of noting. Um, so um, I also um, share uh, um, Commissioner O'Brien's um, notion of trying to manage the overall uh, budget. I was actually prepared to suggest a modest uh, increase um, to both temper, um, you know, the need to and desire to keep our uh, our costs um, um, managed uh, manageable in a in, in a time of of um, you know of, of decreased activity and and and, and serious budget considerations. Um, but I guess I was I was ending on the modest increase side uh, by virtue of uh, the difficulty of this year, uh, Karen's outstanding job and um, um, you know and uh, perhaps um, the last time we did this uh, was now a, a couple of, a few years ago um, when we did when we did an increase um, I suppose that could be tempered with what Commissioner O'Brien suggested that uh, if we can come back and look at it retrospectively or retroactively rather but I would be also comfortable with uh, with offering a small increase to reflect um, all of those aspects Commissioner Cameron. Thank you, Commissioner Zuniga. Yes, um, you know, I, in look, and these numbers were very helpful, by the way, to take a look at it. I, I know, you know, many things about different jurisdictions, but I don't know that that's relevant here. Other than, um, you know, if we're looking at Karen's performance, first of all, she has, she came in with extensive gaming uh, background, which our last executive director did not. And for that reason, um, you know, one of the reasons, the second reason would be uh, an outstanding job in a very, very trying year. But, uh, you know, I would be, I would be uh, in a normal circumstance, I would be absolutely inclined to raise that salary due to those factors. Uh, but in this environment, I, I, I understand and agree with Commissioner O'Brien that we should um, make note of the excellent work that's been done, but also be um, be mindful of the gaming situation um, and our licensees uh, situation. So I, um, I agree with that recommendation that we hold at this point, but also really want to make note of, uh, of, the, of the work that's been done in a very trying time and also um, the fact that the, this is not a candidate that came in without gaming experience. So I would echo um, <clears throat> Commissioner Cameron's and Commissioner Zuniga's uh, sentiments. Um, I think my notes uh, reflect exactly what you started with, Commissioner Cameron, is that I'm acutely aware of the fact that Karen Wells came in with um, significant more experience than um, uh, perhaps um, ex relevant experience, perhaps more so than the two former executive directors. Um, and so I'm quite aware of the fact that even keeping her at the same amount um, creates, uh, you know, uh, an equity concern that we might not only want to address, um, but probably need to address uh, down the road if we are going to defer. Um, I think that we are all very, um, and I and I think I can share this. We have a Karen that we're all quite aware the fact that the environment for the casinos right now is so challenging that um, maybe waiting. Um, to address this compensation issue makes good sense and is fair uh, to our licensees. Um, I thought that the uh, historic data was helpful. I do think that um, as I looked at them, I, you know, Commissioner Zunica notes that the highest ones are have a very different set of obligations. We 
in many ways are fortunate that we have up to four licensees um, to to oversee uh, that 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 is a different playing field than certainly what Nevada um, navigates in, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Um, we also have a different governing structure. And I'm not sure if that was necessarily considered when the initial um, uh, compensation was set. Uh, that might be something in the future when you know we arrive at that steady state that people dream up, um, where um, perhaps uh, a future executive director, if Karen takes what could possibly be a better alternative down the road, which it's hard for me to imagine, Karen. So um, we'll put that aside. But at, at a certain point in time, that the um, the job may may look and feel very different. But given the complexities of this last year, the challenges of last year, and Karen's extensive experience, as well as potential expansion of responsibilities um, in the near future, again, we don't know um, about sports wagering, uh, if that will happen. But if it were to happen, that would be uh, additional significant new responsibilities for the executive director to oversee. Um, all of those factors, I would say, warrant us to uh, certainly look back with care. Um, if we were to revisit this at the end of the year in conjunction with a timely second evaluation. Um, with that said, I would also be comfortable with a slight boost um, that Commissioner uh, Zunica um, mentioned. Uh, but again, slight is probably not the appropriate um, word to use in light of all the um, assessments we would make in a normal year, but strictly because of the, uh, the economic environment right now, as we are seeing a hopeful light at the end of the tunnel. So Commissioner O'Brien has made a recommendation to stay. Um, Commissioner O'Brien, with the thoughts that you've heard from us, uh, I, I, I really do defer to your lead on this. Quite frankly, with all that you've discussed and bringing up the fact that there could be expansion and job opportunities and responsibilities for the executive director position. Um, if a fourth casino is coming online this year, if, you know, online gaming comes and is given to this commission, those are also other opportunities to be revisiting what would be sort of the base salary and then looking at a particular to Karen. Um, but I think for me also the overarching, and again, not in any way diminishing, I think she's doing an outstanding job. I also just think um, also from a fundamental soundness and fairness position in terms of the finances of the licensees who, who pay um, essentially for the functioning of this office, that I, I am staying with the recommendation that we keep her where she is for the time being. Uh, that, that continues to be mine, obviously, if someone wants to make a motion to the contrary happy to hear them. Uh, so is that in the form of a motion? I don't, I mean, maybe I should ask Todd at this point, if we're not taking any further action on what she's currently making, I don't know that we need a vote, but I defer to the general counsel on whether we do. Yeah, I, I think if, if you're not changing anything, you probably don't need to take any action. I, what I can't recall specifically is when the salary was set, whether it was done on a permanent basis or with the understanding that it needed to be reviewed and ratified or looked at? I, I think one thing I might have misspoke, and Karen, I hate to put you on the spot, but you would know best perhaps, uh, and, and you may not know this. I think we said it at the 185 in September when you, um, when we did our fi final evaluation and, and put you into the, uh, the, the full-time position out of the interim. Did we make that retroactive back to no. the beginning? Okay. No, no. And, you know, it, it may be helpful uh, for me to comment here because uh, Commissioner O'Brien and I have discussed this, uh, and we're in agreement uh, that, you know, my personal feeling is that uh, staff right now did not get raises because of the situation with the pandemic. And I just don't think uh, I could accept any kind of increase be until the staff gets an increase. So I think, um, you know, your conversations are consistent with the conversations I've had with Commissioner O'Brien that uh, I need to do the right thing with respect to the other people that work in this agency. And I'm part of that team. And it's not right for the 
highest paid employee to get a raise when the other people haven't got raises yet. So I think that makes sense across the board and we'll just uh, all be in this together and, and all move along together and hopefully things will get better as time goes on. And so that would be, we revisit this in December, um, Commissioner O'Brien. So unless a circumstances warrant revisiting it before that, which is absolutely an option. Excellent, yes. Commissioner Zinnica, are you, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Karen. I, I think um, uh, until you mentioned it, there's, there's, there's an, um, in our minds at least, or at least in mine, there's a notion of, you know, we said the, the executive director salary, but then there's a trickle down, if you will, that, and, and what it means for the rest of the agency. Um, there's another gauge, by the way, that we haven't seen in a while, and I, I should mention it now. Um, and that's also the adjustment uh, that comes from time to time to the uh, salaries of, of commissioners. Uh, I don't know, that, that, that in my mind has also been a bit of a gauge as to what the rest of the state is, is, is thinking is appropriate for, given the environment that it operates under. One of, one of scrutiny and balance about uh, you know, trying to retain people and trying to do well by the, by the taxpayers. Um, that's just to say that you know I'm I'm persuaded by 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 your comments, Commissioner O'Brien, and, and I'm I'm happy to look at these at a, at a future time, even with uh, with with the possibility of of, of acting retroactively. Good. Then, if there's no, if we have a general consensus, I think uh, Commissioner Cameron, you expressed uh, your alignment with Commissioner O'Brien from the start. Um, I am. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and um, I have been as well um, with just some observations for us to think about as we, you know, approach this important decision the next time around. Um, so with that said, uh, Karen, thank you for your thoughtfulness on this. Um, we, we appreciate it. And I think we're all set then the uh, compensation, Commissioner O'Brien will stay at 185. Okay, consensus, excellent. Any further comments on that, commissioners? No, no thank other, you for all the work. Yeah, other than to say that Karen's comments to you, I think also speak um, volumes to why we put her in the position that we did. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah, right. I don't, I'm not sure if it speaks volumes as to her negotiation skills, but <laughs> definitely as to her, her sense of fairness and, and um, her team leadership. It's brilliant and that's what matters to us. So thank you. Um, uh, I think that that concludes our, our formal items. Uh, Karen, thank you. We know that this is never um, a comfortable process and we've gotten through this with you um, in, uh, in a way that we knew would work out just fine. So thank you. We are now um, up to our commissioner updates. So commissioners, do you have something to update us on? Um, I can. I just. Um, I just attended uh, a virtually uh, a conference uh, from the that's put together every year by the uh, British Columbia Lottery Corporation, um, of which from which we you might remember we uh, licensed the GameSense uh, brand and approach. Uh, they have uh, a responsible gaming conference every year around this time uh, that is really good, well attended from. Um, practitioners and, 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 and people from all around uh, the world. It's called the New Horizons um, uh, Conference. Uh, this, this year it was uh, a, a, you know, a, an abridged program, um, but really interesting as, as in other years. Uh, some of those presentations are gonna be available um, online and, and or um, digitally, and, and I will um, try to uh, circulate or have Mark and Teresa, who also attended, uh, circulate the ones uh, that they might find more um, more relevant. But if I could um, uh, uh, mention a couple of things, prominently there was a session with uh, Dr. Richard Wood, who we have had uh, before us, uh, evaluating our um, our positive play approach, uh, which is something that is gaining quite a bit of uh, traction in you know, around, around the world with the work that he and others have done and led, uh, which is also very encouraging uh, to see. Um, there was also a panel uh, relative to 
uh, sports betting, which is another uh, big topic of, of conversation. And um, one, um, you know, a couple of uh, ca words of caution from, from, from people relative to um, some of what other places have done and some of the things that are being repeated in the United States, uh, namely around the topic of in-game betting, uh, which brings up a lot of um, uh, responsible gaming topics because of the speed of play and, and, and so on, uh, as well as uh, some of the marketing uh, that is taking place uh, in all these partnerships between media companies as well as, and then, um, you know, online gaming operators. Uh, the notion that sports uh, with its interest throughout uh, our society, uh, really, it's, it's, it's everywhere, um, brings in a whole set of, uh, of, of, of new players, perhaps, or, or new interest, especially in some, some uh, groups that are, have been uh, deemed higher risk, um, from the studies in the past, you know, younger males or, you know, maybe underage, uh, not minors, but underage. Um, so, um, and the dilemma that um, when, um, when uh, approving uh, sports betting, which usually now these days um, has an online component, um, there's both opportunities and risks from a regulatory standpoint um, in the sense of, um, there is, there is now ability to track play and, and, and perhaps insert, um, you know, responsible gaming measures. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, it, it brings in the, the familiarity of, of, of a much younger generation, in this case, minors, who are also potentially, uh, uh, you know, real target of, of, of this activity. But I encourage, uh, again, I will distribute uh, some of these um, PowerPoints when made available. Um, and there were great discussions and, um, and work um, for checking them out. You should definitely share with uh, Karen and Jill, and I commend um, the team, Karen and, and under with uh, Jill's leadership, their continued work um, to support the legislature as requested, um, any requests that come in on, on sports betting as legislation continues to percolate. So um, the team continues to to be responsive on that front. So you should share that. Mark, I think also is keeping Karen and team pretty apprised on those developments as well. Is that fair, Karen? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, Gail, do you have any update? Thank you, Enrique. It's great. Do you have any update, Karen and Gail? I do not, but I want to thank uh, Commissioner Zuniga. That was a really informative update. And it's, I know that we pay a lot of attention to that issue responsible gaming. So um, it's nice that we're yeah. always exploring what those best practices are. And frankly, we are part of those best practices. That's right. Right. And, um, and Commissioner Zuniga, that's why I know that Jill will, will really like to hear the details. So if you could share them, that'd be, Absolutely. That'd be great. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have anything further? I don't know. No, I just want to also th thank, uh, um, um, Victor Ortiz of the Department of Public Health who presented last uh, at our last meeting um, with respect to um, Gambling Awareness Month. He conducted uh, DPHs in his office of problem gambling first listening sessions for the community stakeholders um, <clears throat> and did a nice job. Uh, we quite properly don't actually engage in with the stakeholders uh, because of our position, but he will be providing us um, the benefit of the feedback. Uh, so we'll stay tuned on that, but I did attend and he allowed us to share a few words about our own community engaged research and work. So thank you for that opportunity. So with that said, um, if there's no other business then we can allow one commissioner to get to an appointment on time and um, we'll need a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thanks, Commissioner Zuniga. Commissioner Cameron? Uh, do we have, I'll second it then. Okay. Um, there you are, Commissioner O'Brien, you moved on me. Commissioner Cameron? Aye. Commissioner O'Brien? Aye. Commissioner Zuniga? Aye. And I vote yes, or zero. Thank you to everyone. Uh, as I asked, take that moment today to reflect on 
on, on all that's happened in the past year and, and let's look forward to the year ahead. Um, Vivian, thank you for all your help today. We appreciate it and thank you, um, Executive Director Wells, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Bye.